What I want to do in my talk is give you an outline for where we are with current technologies that allow us to invasively and then non-invasively modulate brain activity. And I want to sort of motivate why to do this, because there's a lot of ethical questions about this research. Um, you'll be interested to learn that actually the idea of in invasively or non-invasively modulating brain activity is very old. Scribonius Largus, who was a physician to the Roman emperor, actually was trying to modulate brain activity almost 2,000 years ago. So this is a torpedo fish that you see on the screen. It has a little gill on the bottom of it that can actually stun with electricity its prey. And what Scribonius was doing was literally taking people into the ocean. He had a little uh, cage where this fish was. He put their head in the water and grabbed the fish and put it on top of their head. And at least according to this book, this is not a scientific study of course, but at least according to this book he was able to reduce headaches he was actually able to help people with relationship problems and also cure all kinds of mystical things that we don't believe in anymore. <laughs> One of the problems that Scribonius had, of course, is he didn't really have a good science of the brain. He didn't have these beautiful brain imaging um, and brain mapping technologies that you've heard about today and that you know about. We have that advantage now. So we know what's going on in the normal brain uh, when people are doing all kinds of tasks in the lab. We also know what the brain looks like in depression, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and we're learning new information about these diseases every day. And so we're in an interesting situation where we have brain imagers who have all this data, I mean billions and billions of dollars worth of data in their labs, and we know what it looks like to have something like depression, and yet depression is still on the rise. Alzheimer's disease is on the rise, Parkinson's disease. So our, our pharmacological approaches, which has been the main way to treat these um, diseases so far, hasn't been able to keep up, even though we're learning more and more about these diseases every day. And so this is what keeps me up at night. I think, you know, all this data is out there and I could really help people. I could give them transformative experiences if I could figure out how to get in there and modulate brain activity. Now, as a graduate student at the University of Arizona, I actually worked with some of these modalities. So this is deep brain stimulation. You actually insert a tiny little microelectrode down into the basal ganglia. It's a small little part right in the middle of the brain. And it's, it's used to treat all kinds of disorders. So typically Parkinson's disease, and there's been over 100,000 uh, Parkinson's patients treated with this. And in terms of transformative technologies, I've seen this. I mean, every time I see this in the operating room, I just want to break down and cry because I know that this is going to transform this person's life. And actually one of the patients, um, so I was running an experiment in the OR, actually while they're on the operating room table. Because it's brain surgery, they have to be awake, right? And so one of the patients turns to me and he says, you know, I got this diagnosis the year that I retired. So he had waited his whole life to retire, of course, and he saved up all of his money. And all he wanted to do was walk the beaches um, in his favorite places with his wife and hold her hand and play golf. He, he was a golfer. And you right after they get that stimulator down into the basal ganglia and turn it on, they find the right rhythm for that patient, and you can see those motor tremors just go down to almost nothing. Almost all of the patients this happens, and they have a lot of rigidity in their hands. That rigidity just frees right up. And the patient turns to me, and you can just tell in his eyes. I mean, he's tearing up, I'm tearing up, some of the nurses are tearing up, right? It's a pretty obvious case of a transformative technology. Now, there's a big problem with this, of course, which is you have to drill a hole in people's head. Um, this is expensive, and of course, people don't want to have these uh, surgeries done. And so as I was watching these surgeries and thinking, you know, this is really awesome. We, we know enough about the brain to know where to target. We know what type of frequencies to put in. Even though it's not curing the disease, we can at least give them some quality of life back. Um, but, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could do this without having to bring them into the operating room and drilling a hole in their head? And so I started getting interested in other modalities where we could bypass the skull and non-invasively modulate brain activity, and ideally in a safe way, right? If we're going to do this in humans, we want, to be, we want to make sure that we can do this safely. And so there's all kinds of technologies that are already here. There's one called transcranial magnetic stimulation. It uses strong magnetic coils, so you can't do this at home. You have to go into a physician's office or you have to come into our lab to do this. Um, and we typically have a physician with us on call. Um, but this has been a great scientific tool for mapping the brain and learning new things about brain function. It was also approved by the FDA um, in 2008 to treat depression. So this is working really well for depressed patients um, up there with pharmaceuticals and better in some cases. Uh, one of the problems is that it's relatively expensive and it actually causes a little bit of lockjaw, so it hurts a little bit to the patients um, and they're having trouble getting the patients to come back. 
Now there's another method um, that takes advantage of electricity. So you've probably heard of this, transcranial direct current stimulation. You're going to hear about this later in the day, so I won't talk too much about it. But this has also been used to study all kinds of things about brain function, and it's being applied to almost every disorder you can imagine. So a new study recently came out showing you could actually use this to reduce the motor symptoms in Parkinson's as well. And this one you can actually do at home. Um, so there's all kinds of devices now you can buy. There's consumer level devices that are out there. I believe that the FDA is about to enter into talks about whether to regulate this stuff, but that, that gives you an idea. They're starting to get the sense that this is coming out to the consumers, and we need to think about these technologies carefully. Now, one of the problems with these methods, and especially in relation to what I showed you with deep brain stimulation, is that TMS and TDCS can't reach very deep structures in the brain. They can only reach superficial levels in the cortex in practice. And so that limits, that greatly limits what we can do in terms of modulation of brain activity. And so in our lab, what we've been doing is looking at other modalities. Um, there's things I won't talk about, like you can use low infrared light, for example. Um, but the direction we've gone in is actually to look at sound. So we're talking about sound waves beyond the threshold for human hearing, which is ultrasound. And this is around the range that's being used in hospitals for medical imaging um, all over the world. So we're about 500 kilohertz to about 2 megahertz. Now we know that ultrasound can pass through the skull. You can focus it through. You can use multiple transducers to focus multiple targets at once. And we know at low intensities that we can do this safely, meaning that we can modulate biological activity without doing any damage to it. Now, if you go to high intensities, just like with any energy, of course, you can damage the brain. Um, but we have a nice history of uh, ultrasound being used for medical imaging to know what intensities are safe. So uh, just one piece of evidence. I won't bore you with all the science. But this is out of a lab at Harvard. You can see a little rabbit there in the cartoon, and there's a focus transducer. They're actually doing this in the scanner. So they have a tiny little animal scanner. It's about this big. It sits in one of the labs at Harvard. And the animal is sitting in the scanner, and what they can do is they can actually find areas of brain activation with their target. So it's MR guided, and then they can modulate those brain areas to do mapping of the brain or whatever you're trying to do. So you can see those little red blobs are increases in brain activity. They actually show decreases in brain activity as well at different frequencies. So you can modulate both up and down, um, which is important. And then what they showed here is that they could actually get the animal to move its limbs. It was anesthetized, um, but they were hitting the motor cortex. Definitely get brain activation with the system. Now, importantly, especially when we're thinking about doing this in humans, is they looked at the brain, and they looked for any damage at different scales. Um, and at these intensity levels, which are actually just intensity levels that are used for medical imaging, they didn't find any damage. Um, but all the neuroscience studies where they look at this in animals are going to be looking for damage, just to make sure. So what we've done, and what several other labs have started to do, is try to do um, this type of ultrasound, but in humans. And what the image here was sort of an optimistic image until about four weeks ago. This is showing focused ultrasound going through the skull, and not doing any kind of surgery or anything. And we're targeting the thalamus. So that's a very deep brain structure. That's something you can't do with the current technologies like TMS or TDCS. And a paper was actually just published down the road at UCLA where they showed that uh, a, a patient who was, I believe, in a motorcycle accident slipped into a coma. They used focus ultrasound in the MRI to wake that patient up. So this is the first published demonstration in humans that you can target deep brain structures to modulate behavior, and in this case, generate consciousness or st stimulate consciousness. Now, of course, what I'm talking about is putting some type of energy into the brain. And the question is always, how is this? Is this safe? Do you know this is safe? Well. Um, I found this picture actually on a website called Why Women Live Longer Than Men. Um, so if you get bored later, look that up. There's all kinds of fascinating, funny pictures, crazy pictures actually. Um, but we know that we've been using ultrasound in all kinds of interesting ways, both for imaging but also for muscle therapy, uh, ablation, all kinds of things on the body. So we have a nice literature that we can look at to know what the, the safe intensity levels are. And if you're interested, the FDA puts a guideline at 720 milliwatts per centimeter square. And then, you know, you, you have to think about using that over time as well. So there's a lot of parameters that we worry about when we use this. So we believe, and we have evidence to back this up, that the intensity levels that we're using are just too low to cause any damage. They can modulate the biology without causing any kind of structural damage. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to ask, can we modulate mood? So like I said, neuroimaging studies are starting to give us a picture of what uh, brain areas are doing in terms of function. And we're interested in trying to find treatments for mood disorders like depression. 
And actually, Dr. Stuart Hameroff presented last year, I believe, at this conference, and he was actually trying to uh, modulate pain in chronic pain patients. So he took an imaging ultrasound device, and you saw that image earlier maybe, and actually just put it up to the chronic pain patients' heads and found that the pain seemed to decrease slightly, but it wasn't significant. But he did find a significant increase in mood. And we got very interested in that because we thought, okay, well, chronic pain patients, it's hard to make them feel better, right? So maybe you decreased their pain, which made them feel better. Or perhaps because you put it up on the frontal cortex, which is involved in mood, you actually manipulated their mood circuits. And so we decided to do some very constrained studies where we could go after that hypothesis. We took healthy undergraduates with no mood disorder, on no medications, um, and we basically asked, can we target mood circuits in the brain and modulate their mood, make them feel better, um, hopefully. So we used an, an, a, a focused ultrasound device. So this is not designed for imaging. It's designed just for focused ultrasound in humans. And this was uh, designed by Jamie uh, Tyler and Izzy Goldwasser, who at the time were working at Think, which is the company that has a little brain stimulator. And I don't know if you can see this, but the transducers there in blue, this is what our model suggests is the target stimulation site. So you can see it's relatively focal. Um, the length is kind of long, it's several centimeters, but that red focal zone is where we think we should get biological neuromodulation. And that's about four millimeters long and about two millimeters wide. So that's an order of magnitude better than TMS. TMS is centimeters or more. Um, and it's actually on the order of magnitude for the deep brain stimulation that I showed you earlier. Um, the graph's not really that important, but what it says is that by stimulating the right frontal cortex in our participants, we could make them feel better. So a movement up on this graph basically means that they reported feeling happier, less sadness, maybe more in the moment, kind of like if they had meditated for a little bit. Um, just kind of what you would expect if you get a little bit more control over your emotional systems. And then we placebo controlled, double blinded, nobody, you know, the researchers didn't know what condition the subjects were in, subjects didn't know as well. So we replicated this, we replicated Dr. Hameroff's study, and we actually replicated this two other times in a different group of participants. We also tried stimulating different parts of the brain, which is nice about this, because now we can say, well, we don't think visual cortex should be involved in mood regulation that much, right? So if we stimulate back there, we shouldn't see these effects, and that's exactly what we found. So we can make people feel better. Pretty cool, huh? Then, uh, when I started presenting this to scientists at conferences, they said, well, these are self-report measures. That's not very believable. People can be wrong about how they feel, right? Or maybe you suggested to them or something like that. So what we decided to do is look at functional connectivity in the fMRI. So basically, if I brought you in, put you in the scanner, and just sat you in the scanner for five minutes, I could record what's called the resting state. You would sort of go into this default mode. You start thinking to yourself. I'm sure some of you are doing that right now, which is totally normal. And then you would switch out of it, and you would come back in and out of that. So we know this pattern of brain activity for resting in the scanner. It turns out if you put depressed people in the scanner, which we've done, and you look at their resting state, you get a pattern of brain activity and connectivity, so how brain areas are talking to each other, that um, sort of explains what you might, it's sort of a picture that you might imagine for depression. So they have more default mode. They're sort of thinking to themselves more, specifically in these sort of negative emotion mood circuits, right? So they're thinking, oh, this experiment's stupid, and why did I come to this experiment? The researcher's kind of dumb, and he's really geeky. You know, they're sort of thinking these things over and over. Also, you see decreased connectivity in cognitive control mechanisms, cognitive control systems, which makes sense as, as well, right? Because they, whenever you give them some negative emotional stimulus, for example, they have a, a hard time suppressing that. It sort of gets locked in the cognitive system, and then that spirals out of control. And so we thought, okay, we know what the depressed brain looks like. We've stimulated some of these circuits in our healthy people. Might we see the opposite pattern in our healthy controls? And I have a really long and lengthy, lengthy analysis. I'll just show you one little snippet of that. But basically, what you see is a seeded analysis. So I'm seeding that part of the brain that we stimulated. And then you're seeing all the brain areas that are connected to that. So this is just at rest, healthy controls before stimulation of the brain. What you see afterwards is a lot of blue areas, so decreased connectivity. Um, and basically decreased connectivity to limbic centers and then increased connectivity to cognitive control centers. So essentially what we've done is we've made their brain sort of in the opposite direction of what you would expect a depressed brain to look like, which maps on to why they might be feeling better in our studies. Now, what we want to do with this, of course, is couple this in some type of context. We don't want to just be willy-nilly stimulating people's brains. 
And what we're doing is we're actually bringing depressed participants into the lab. We're stimulating them or giving them um, a placebo condition. And then we want to couple that with therapy. Because the idea is that we're sort of bumping these brain mechanisms up to a more normal level. And I know that's sort of a loaded word. Um, but to a more normal level. And then we can give them cognitive therapy or some type of other therapy, which then might give sort of a, a feedback loop in the therapeutic session. We're also thinking about doing this um, in a meditation study as well. So we're mixing all kinds of different brain stimulation in this study. And what we want to do is we want to try to target brain systems that might give us a boosted effect in the meditation sessions. So maybe reducing self-talk, for example, or increasing cognitive control, or reducing that sort of internal mode that I was talking about and trying to get people sort of more externally oriented. So we can do this both with the direct current stimulator systems that I was talking about and with the targeted ultrasound neuromodulation systems to see if we could sort of give people um, the, the types of transformative experience you see with meditation in most people, but can we do it in half the time or can we get a bigger effect um, for some people? A lot of people sort of plateau at a certain level. Now, in thinking about where this technology is going, what we can do with this is actually start trying to map the brain areas. So we're, we're learning a lot about the brain, but we're still sort of in the dark ages in some sense, right? And so we can get sort of a feedback situation in the lab where we take people in, we want to know which areas to target for mood regulation. So we do controlled experiments to try to map the brain areas with targeted ultrasound. And then we sort of use that to derive hypotheses about stimulating in depressed patients or people with anxiety or even Parkinson's disease. And so we can sort of get a feedback system in the lab where we're sort of deriving brain targets and seeing if that works in the patients and if it does or doesn't, you know, feeding that back into our scientific studies. And the way that I see this working is that this sort of serves as a bridge for these future technologies that we're all sort of hearing about and starting to get excited about, like neural lace, which is what you're going to hear about next. So this is an implantable uh, mesh technology. You actually implant it right in the brain, and this has happened in rats. Um, and with these technologies, the promise is that we're going to be able to directly interface with the brain to get information in and out, for example. That's what Elon Musk has been really interested in. Also for just studying the brain, for getting signals from the brain. Um, but that technology, although very smart people are working on it, it's still very, it's a couple decades away, right? And so these technologies are going to serve as the bridge to get towards that type of technology and that level of neuromodulation. All right, so I just want to thank all the collaborators and thanks for your attention.